is my great pleasure to introduce Jeff Westbrook. Um, again, I'm uh, often asked by graduate students who say, you know, um, I want to do a PhD in theory, theoretical computer science, but what can I do other than a faculty, become a faculty member? And I usually have a standard answer, which goes like, well, uh, uh, OK. Um, so, uh, but uh, hopefully this talk will give me a new answer, OK? Because uh, again, Jeff uh, is a card-carrying computer scientist, theoretical computer scientist, who has gone on to write for The Simpsons and, uh, and other programs. Um, so Jeff got his PhD under Robert Tarjan at Princeton doing uh, dynamic graph algorithms about the time I grad you know, graduated. Um, and he then went on and was a professor at Yale for five years um, before going over to AT&T Research for several years before starting his new life. And um, that's where uh, we're going to learn, I guess, about what that path was and uh, how we go from here. So uh, everybody give a hand to Jeff. And uh, Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'm, uh, you have to have a little bit of technical background for this talk. You have to be familiar with the TV show Futurama. <laughs> uh, I assume you know The Simpsons. Futurama is a science fiction cartoon that, I wouldn't say spun off, it was made by the same creators. Simpsons is set in our world. Futurama is set in the world of 3000. It's about a pizza delivery boy who gets accidentally frozen and wakes up in the year 3000 and has to uh, learn to live there. Okay, so that's some background about that. Um, every few years, so I've been, I've been writing for The Simpsons now for 10 years. Uh, and before that, Futurama, that was my first job. And every few years, someone out there notices that there's a fair amount of math and science in The Simpsons. And they do something about it. And in the, the most recent situation is that a, a guy called Simon Singh, who's a science writer, British science writer, wrote this book called The Simpsons and Their Mathematical Se Secrets. And whenever something like this happens, then I get calls and saying, can I come be on a panel or can, can I come give a talk? And so that is why I'm here today. So the premise of this talk then is that there's a lot of math and science in The Simpsons. There's a lot of math and scientists working for the show. And there are uh, questions about why and how and all this stuff. The Westbrook DLS was an um, exciting affair for me. I have always been concerned about how uh, the media and the broader community perceives um, scientific uh, disciplines, especially uh, things like computer science and engineering and some of the fundamental sciences. Um, the DLS talk really showed what kind of an impact uh, a popular show like Simpsons can have uh, on the wider public. And it's important that we pay attention to these uh, narratives and how science gets discussed uh, in domains, uh, in popular domains like media, cartoons, and things that are accessible to the public. Ken Keeler and I had written a, a paper about compact encodings of planar graphs that we published in Discrete Applied Math. And David Cohn had written a paper about a pancake flipping problem, which he'd also published in Discrete Applied Math, but he, did, we didn't, he didn't know about ours. And he, he got his job at Simpsons and walked, in, walked up to Ken Keeler and discovered that not only was he not the only comedy writer in LA with an advanced degree in computer science, he was also not the only comedy writer to have published a paper in Discrete Applied Mathematics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, now, me, I, uh, you know, I, took a job with Futurama. That was my first job. And uh, you know, when I got there, I said, so I guess, I guess you guys hired me because you liked my spec script that I wrote. And they said, no, we hired you because we heard you're an expert in cryptography. That is, <laughs> no, that's not entirely true. But the problem at the time they had was that in the show, they decided to create an alien alphabet. And they put some messages, they, they, they start, started putting messages in the background all over the show in the salient alphabet. And the first time it appeared, they sort of thought, OK, well, probably eventually some people will figure out what this, what this alphabet is and they'll start to translate it. And within 20 minutes, I believe, the first solution appeared on the internet. So they were annoyed at that. So they said, well, can we do one a little harder than that? So here is the second alphabet they proposed. And they said, can you please make it a little harder for them to decode it? That's what my very first job was on Futurama, not pitching jokes. So <coughs> the, 
Now, if you really want to make something hard, you should probably come up with an entire alien universe and different concepts and different languages, but that seemed a little too tricky. So instead, I said, well, why don't we just do the standard encoding where you take uh, the, the, uh, the ith, oh boy, the ith output digit will just be the sum of the preceding digits, input digits, mod. 26. Very simple. And that took a year for them to decode. But in the end, some guy got it and we said, boy, that guy's really smart. We shouldn't have gone into the show. And we, we never did. DLS, the lecture series, is an example of the culture of the department where they bring in distinguished lecturers from outside. Uh, they talk about their work. This is extremely inspiring for uh, junior faculty as well as the students to see the great things that the people uh, around the world are working on. One day, Futurama decided that they were going to do an episode where two characters switch their minds. And the, the, there's a character called the professor who's a crazy old professor. You've never met anybody like him, I'm sure. And he has a, uh, a Chinese graduate student, <laughs> which I'm sure is, you know, a foreign world to you guys. And he invents uh, this machine that switches brains. Now, but there's, there's one problem. You can switch brains with somebody else, but then you can't switch back. No two people can swap two ways. Now, first, first a little story about writing a, a TV show. So you want to do a show about people switching brains. But the problem is that you say, well, Jesus, that's been done a lot. You know, is there some twist we can do on that? And the second thing you say to yourself is, well, if two people switching brains is funny, then 200 switching brains must be hilarious. So, <laughs> so you say to yourself, they, this is what happens. It's like, well, what if they can't switch back, so everyone's switching brains all around? Wouldn't that be great? So that was the premise for the show. But then somebody said, yeah, but can we actually ever fix this problem? Can we actually ever get everybody's brain back into their heads again? So Ken Keeler, who's working on the show, as I mentioned, he's a applied math uh, PhD, said, all right, this is a pretty easy problem. So you can think of it, I mean, sometimes I think of this as you've got, a, you've got, a, you've got an undirected graph. You know, you've got all these people. It starts out as a complete graph for, for our point of view. And if you ever swap the contents of A and B here, you have to delete this edge. And then you can never swap between these two guys again. And you know, you can do a whole bunch of swaps and do an arbitrary permutation. The question is, can you get everybody back into their heads? And as they, as they pointed out, there's an obvious, very simple counterexample. You've got two people, A and B, and you swap them and delete their edge, then you're done. There's nothing more you can do. They can never switch back again. Okay? And then he suggests that maybe you can use some temporary storage. You can put Mr. P here. And if you think about it, you've now got, you've, you've used this edge up. You've got two more edges. It's obvious, really, that there's nothing you can do, right? Because I can swap B with P. And I can swap, you know, these guys. But, I've, but then I've burned all my... Uh, I burned all my edges and I'm down to, to, to nothing. Okay, so can you do it with four? So you've got Mr. A, you've got slot A. Okay, so let's say we've swapped these two guys. We'd like to get A over into big A and B back into big A, all right? And with these guys, we've added a whole bunch of options of swaps. So. You basically use these guys as temporary storage. You swap P and A. Sorry, this is now B. You burn that edge. Okay, you got Q up here now. This is A. Okay, this is supposed to be P. I'm using little P's and big P's. I'm sure it's very confusing. All right. Now you can swap here. You got little a over here. You got little p here. You do this swap, but you burn this one. You got q here, and you've got b here. And now you have one last transition to get everybody back to where they are. Okay, that all makes sense. All right. So now, 
What if I've got a cycle? Well, you know, I've got a cycle of permutations here. I've sent three guys around. If you stop and think about it, the same procedure will basically work, right? What I'm going to do is start with one of my guys and start swapping like if, you know, if, so what I'm saying here is that A is sitting here and B is sitting here and C is sitting here. Well, or maybe it's the other way around. Uh, you can start, you can do the same thing we did here except that P just keeps swapping with people forward. He just can't burn the last couple of ones and then you use this. And then of course, since any permutation admits a cycle decomposition, then you've solved the problem for any permutation, right? I'll propose the following generalization or open problem here. You have, you have some graph. You can swap contents, by de but they're leading edges. You don't necessarily swap them all. But it costs you to buy these extra people, or even just costs you to add more edges in, OK? If I give you a graph and a permutation and a set of edges that are there, and, and I tell you a cost function, what's the minimum cost way to restore everybody back to there? to their heads. Now, I'm not saying this is a significant problem or <laughs> an important problem, but if you were to write a paper about this, you would get to have as your first citation Matt Groening et al. 20th Century Fox Studios, Futurama Episode 3. So, or 300, so keep that in mind. All right. I'll show one more little clip and then you guys can ask questions. You know, this is where I'm supposed to talk about, oh yes. So why is it that, uh, all these people ended up working at Futurama in particular. Well, some of it's just serendipity. We all knew each other from uh, old days. Some of it's probably grad students thinking it might actually be easier to get a job in network TV than to get a faculty position. Uh, some of it, I think, is the fact that there's a whimsy in mathematics and there's a whimsy to these cartoons that you can't find elsewhere in TV. Um, and, I, and so I would say, if, you know, if you're doing any kind of mathematics, keep in mind the whimsy factor. That's always good. It worked for Lewis Carroll. He, was, he, he worked for us. And is there anything more to say? I don't know. <laughs> I can never figure this out. It remains a mystery to me exactly how we all ended up in there. A while ago, there was a kerfuffle when Lawrence Summer, who was then president of Harvard, suggested that there, were, there was fewer female faculty in the hard sciences because maybe it was just harder for them to do math and science. He, he didn't put it quite as bluntly as that, but that was, uh, that was the take. We got into a lot of trouble. And so we thought we'd do a little show about that. And in our show, uh, the principal of the elementary school, Principal Skinner, he invites, there's a distinguished female comes back and he's, he's she's going to give a little presentation much like this. And uh, he says, well, it's great to have you back. You're always a straight A student. And she says, well, not always, you know, A's. I, got, I think I got a few B's in math or whatever. And he said, well, of course you did because you're a girl. And <laughs> this starts in a, a giant fuss in Springfield. And the solution they decide in the end is that they will separate the classes. They will teach boys math and girls math separately. I believe the end of the show, uh, Lisa become, you know, uh, she pretends to be a boy to learn math in the boys' school. But she's forced to have Bart teach her how to belch and generally talk filthy before she'll ever fit in. At the end, she does great. The ruse is revealed, and the boys are outraged. They've been yentled. <laughs> um, that is the end of my prepared remarks, if you could call these prepared. Uh, and so you're now free to ask me any question you like about TV or you know, anything. No takers? Yes, go for it. Um, what's your writing process for getting math into the show? Like, do you just start off thinking, I want to get this mathematical formula into the, as a joke, or has it just come off for you? Sometimes it comes up as part of the story that we're doing. So, for example, I think I mentioned this to the previous people here. I'll say it again. We have an upcoming episode where Lisa joins the math team, and she's in a competition. And so, at the end of the competition, we, have to, we had to come up with a math problem that they could actually solve, and Lisa could win. So that was a story-driven moment. I wouldn't say the joke is particularly funny itself, <laughs> but it's in there. As you saw, a lot of this stuff is just, what can we jam in the background? Uh, I think we would like to take, uh, we have, uh, I guess we kind of honor scientists and math, maybe a little bit too much. We don't generally satirize their, their flaws all that much, but 
Perhaps we could do that. But mostly it's a question of when can we get a joke in, if the joke fits. Mm -hmm. What was your favorite joke to write, not a Futurama in some sense? And what's your favorite Futurama episode? My favorite Futurama episode. Um, I forget what, the, what it's called, but uh, the premise is that Bender is shot into space by a cannon. He floats through space alone. A meteorite hits him and a tiny race develops on his body. He becomes the god of the, this race that lives on his body as he flies through interstellar space. He is not a good god. He causes problems. His people fight. He feels bad. And as he's flying through space, he runs into what could be the real god. <laughs> OK. In that case, let's thank our speaker. Thank you.